In this paper, we argue that asset managers implicitly create subsidies for certain firms. Um, I don't think I need to show this plot um, to this audience, but this just shows assets under management. Currently, we are sitting at around 85 trillion. So you see the numbers changed from billions to trillions. And uh, this industry is growing. Most of these assets are managed against benchmarks. For example, over 10 trillion is, measured, uh, is managed against S&P 500 alone. I list other popular benchmarks on this slide. And as you can see, all numbers are in trillions. Existing research to date has focused primarily on asset pricing implications of benchmarking. And to our knowledge, there isn't any work on corporate implications of benchmarking, which is what this paper is about. In the asset management industry, performance is evaluated relative to benchmarks. And if you ask a manager whether such performance evaluation affects her portfolio choice, the answer would be yes, of course. If I do not have a view on the stock, I will buy it with the exact same weight as in my benchmark. If I have a negative view, I'll underweight it, but not by too much, because if I'm wrong, I risk underperforming my benchmark. So we argue that performance evaluation, the way it's done in the industry, create very strong incentives for manager to invest a fraction of the fund into the benchmark portfolio, or the word closet indexing used by Rob earlier. And uh, the manager would hold this portfolio, benchmark portfolio, regardless of the risk and return characteristics of the constituents, as I'm going to show. So this creates this mechanical demand from asset managers for stocks in the benchmark. And uh, this is the key to the implicit <coughs> subsidy from asset managers for the firms in the benchmark. In particular, the value of a project will be, same project will be different for a firm inside the benchmark and a firm outside, and it will be higher for the firm inside the benchmark. We'll call the difference the benchmark inclusion subsidy. Thank you. Uh, thankfully, we do not have Martin for the discussion who would complain about subsidy, but uh, this really does smell that way. Now, on the last point, when we teach corporate finance, we always tell our students that the value of the project should be independent of the entity undertaking this project. And I guess the most extreme example that we give to students is to explain that a public utility does not have a comparative advantage in funding fintech startups. Yes, it might have a lower cost of capital, but it shouldn't apply that cost of capital to a completely unrelated project with different risk. So this paper creates an exception to this rule. Uh, we analyze a host of other corporate decisions and show that firms inside and outside the benchmark will have different decision rules for mergers and acquisitions, for spin-offs, for IPOs, and other corporate actions. We fully characterize what we call this benchmark inclusion subsidy and show how it varies with firm characteristics, for which firms it will be higher, for which firms it will be lower. In the interest of time, let me go straight to the model. And this is a baby version of the model, a simplified version. Two periods, zero, one. We've got three risky assets, assets one, two, and Y, with uncorrelated cash flows, distributed normally with mean mu and variance sigma squared. The thought experiment would be to place asset one in the benchmark and leave asset two outside the benchmark and we'll be merging with these assets with asset Y. All stock prices are denoted by SI in this model. All stocks are in supply of one share. 
And we also have a riskless asset whose interest rate we normalize to zero. There are two types of investors in the model. There is a fraction lambda C of conventional investors and a fraction of lambda AM of asset managers. All investors have a um, CARA utility. Gamma here is the absolute risk aversion. Now, it is the last talk, and it's a theory paper. So just to get you used to our notation, let's go over one slide that we all know, uh, everything that's on it. So this is the baseline economy with no asset managers. The conventional investor, uh, investors will all demand a, a standard mean variance portfolio in this economy, and asset prices will be given by the standard formula. The price of an asset increases in its expected cash flows and decreases in its risk. And now let's do a thought experiment of combining form I with the asset Y to form a single entity. The prime is the demand, X prime is the demand for the combined asset. Depends on the ex combined expected cash flows and the combined variance. And in this economy, a standard result that we teach uh, trivially holds that the value of the combined asset equals to the value to the sum of the value of the two standalones. There is no cash flow synergy. We shouldn't expect this to be any different. And now let's add asset managers. The compensation of the asset managers is here on top of the slide, and uh, it actually comes out of another project that we are working on in which we endogenize compensation and uh, talk about welfare. But for this project, we take it exogenously. And uh, the way compensation looks in that other project is that it depends on the absolute performance of the portfolio, manager's portfolio, depends on the relative performance relative to a benchmark of the portfolio and has a frac uh, part independent of the uh, um, performance of the portfolio, for example, based on assets under management. Now, the most important uh, element from this compensation for us in this paper is the relative performance one. And B here is the fee for, for relative performance, sensitivity to relative performance. We have empirical, uh, we have data supporting these specifications. This paper just came out in the JF supporting the kind of compensation structure that we look at here. Now let's do the same analysis, but in the economy with asset managers. Let us place uh, asset one in the benchmark and leave assets, asset two and asset Y outside. This doesn't change portfolio choice of conventional investors. They still want a mean variance portfolio, but it does change the portfolio choice of asset managers. So other things equal, the asset managers will demand more of the first asset, which is in the benchmark, this red term here, than the asset that is outside the benchmark. So this red term represents the response to benchmarking, optimal response to benchmarking from asset managers. The, more generally speaking, in a, anticipating the general version of the model, the asset managers will invest the, its risky assets in two portfolios, the mean variance portfolio and the benchmark portfolio, which is um, here. Now, this result is very general. We know that it works also for other preferences. It also works in a multi-period setting. This is simple Merton's ICAPM, and you can think about this benchmark as a hedging portfolio. It hedges under performance relative to benchmark. Um, now, this notice that this demand, additional demand from the manager, because of his performance evaluation, the red term, does not depend at all on the risk and return characteristics of the assets. It only depends on the contract parameters. That's why we call it the mechanical demand. This parameter B, the sensitivity to relative performance, the way to think about it is set B equal to infinity. We will think about this manager as a passive manager, 
that manager will invest everything in the benchmark portfolio. If B is less than infinity, the manager will split the fund between the benchmark portfolio and the mean variance portfolio. Now, ma these managers have this mechanical demand for stock one, which will essentially reduce the available supply of stock one in the market, pushing up its price. And you see exactly that happening in equilibrium. The uh, price of stock one has this red term here, which a way to read it is that the price of stock one is higher than um, the price of stock two, everything else equal, or asset Y. Why? Because of this additional demand from asset managers. Now let's come back to our thought experiment of um, combining firms. Let us first take firm two, which is outside the benchmark, and combine it with asset Y. This merger naturally leaves Y outside the benchmark. And in this economy, we can again compute portfolio demands for uh, the combined assets. You can see that there are no red terms here. They look very similar to what you have seen in the economy without asset managers. And for that reason, the price of the combined asset will be equal to the sum of the prices of the two standalones. And now let's get things cooking and uh, combine firm one, which is in the benchmark, with asset Y. Notice that this effectively brings asset Y into the benchmark. And that firm one is the only firm that has the technology to do that. Investors cannot do that on their own. So look at the optimal demands. No effect on the optimal demand for the, or, or the demand for the conventional investors. But there is a familiar term in the demand of asset managers. And now you if you compare the price of the combined asset, to the uh, sum of the two standalones, you will see that the combined ones is worth more than the two standalones. And this term, the bold term here, is the wedge, which we call the benchmark inclusion subsidy. You can already start noticing in this simple model what this subsidy depends on. It depends on the riskiness of the project. The riskier the project, the more valuable is th this mechanical demand is. It also depends on lambda AM, which is assets under management following the benchmark. The higher it is, the bigger the effect. Now, just stepping aside, there are no cash flow synergy in this model by construction. So what we have here is a pure financial synergy, which is something we tell our students does not exist. In this model, ignoring it would be a mistake. Very quickly summarize what we have seen so far. Uh, as you can see, all the effects go through the discount rate, through the cost of capital. We claim that the cost of capital is different for the firms inside the benchmark and the firm outside. And what would not, and the um, NPV of an investment depends on the entity that is considering that investment. In particular, benchmark firms will undertake acquisitions then no, than non-benchmark firms would not. And um, the subsidy is increasing in the riskiness. The riskier the acquisition, the higher the benchmark inclusion subsidy. Already in this simple model, you can think about spin-offs that leave the asset outside, uh, that the asset lands outside the benchmark. So as it lands outside, it loses part of its value. Now let's go for a more general model with N assets K inside the benchmark. Uh, y can now be a project, an acquisition, anything. And we allow for the correlation among assets. Let's make the firm inside and outside the benchmark, otherwise identical, just for presentation purposes. And let me show you uh, what this benchmark inclusion subsidy is. So this is the value of the project for the firm inside the benchmark. This is the value of the project for the firm outside the benchmark. And um, some of the black terms we have seen already in my simple example. What we have to add here is the red term, which has to do with the correlation rho of the project 
with the cash flows of the assets in place. Let me first run over the empirical implications and then I will give you some intuitions. So this benchmark inclusion subsidy, here is the formula um, for you and the, this is the key to our cross-sectional implications. We know that it's positive if the correlation of the project with the cash flow from existing assets is positive or at least not too negative. That's an empirically plausible case. Now in case you are uh, wondering whether we have uh, thought of a way of creating value for T-bills by, by, by having benchmark firms buy them. No, we can't do that. We are not magicians. So the T-bills are riskless assets are discounted using the risk-free rate. There is no effect on the, risk, on the riskless projects. It always tied to risk. The subsidy is larger if the project uh, cash flows are more correlated with the cash flows from the firm's existing business. So the best that the firm can do is to uh, undertake clones of existing assets, open more Starbucks branches kind of thing. It is also higher, this subsidy, when the market risk aversion is high. This is when this mechanical demand is m the most valuable. It is also larger if assets under management are large. So for benchmarks for which we have the largest AUM following them, this is uh, our prediction. These are the firms for which we will have uh, see the largest effects. And this parameter B, I told you that this is one way of to think of the manager being active or passive. The higher the B is, uh, the more passive managers are. And uh, therefore, they will have bigger mechanical demand and therefore will increase our uh, benchmark inclusion subsidy. We also have a version of the paper where we separate managers into active and passive and make this point a little bit cleaner. Now to the intuitions on the correlations. We already know that stocks of firms inside the benchmark are overpriced because of the private reasons of these asset managers to hold these stocks. Now think of the conventional investors. They want exposure to cash flows of benchmark stocks, but instead of buying these overpriced stocks, they would rather go for a cheaper substitute, a firm outside the benchmark, but with cash flows highly positively correlated with the ones of the benchmark firm. So naturally, in equilibrium, the price of that stock outside the benchmark will also be higher. So now with these correlations, our subsidy spreads across to all stocks. So this is true for all stocks, not just uh, stocks inside the benchmark. And um, this is also true for projects. You can think of um, that projects that have cash flows that are correlated with those of benchmark firms, those projects will be valued higher. Um, we have, uh, this is a theory paper, but we have tried to gather um, empirical evidence that would um, help us with the, uh, understand their implications. So um, there is a literature on the index effect, and uh, clearly our model is consistent with the index effect. But the empirical literature on the index effect just measures the average effect of index inclusion what we've got to say is the, also the cross-section, how this index effect should vary across firms. Now, our model says that um, it is the benchmark that should matter and not the index. And uh, usually, it's fairly difficult to disentangle the two. But thanks to the word ESG has been spoken, socially responsible investing. And let me do a plug for Marchin. <laughs> that he couldn't do. And um, so he has a very nice paper on sin stocks, alcohol, tobacco, these kind of stocks that are shunned by socially responsible investors. So they're out of their benchmarks, but they're still in the index. And so Marchin and Harrison, they find that the price valuations of these stocks are 15 to 20% lower than their peers that are non-sin. They are very much consistent with our story. 
Now, there is a paper by Benna et al. that we really like because it fully supports our <laughs> implications. They uh, argue that benchmark firms, they invest more, they employ more people, and they accept more uh, riskier projects using cross-country data. And finally, a nice test for our Lambda AM, a AUM of Asset Managers Mattering, is this paper by Chang Hong and Liskovich, where they look at movements from the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000 index. So when a company is doing well and moves from Russell 2000 to a Russell 1000 index, it, its price falls. It falls by 5%, even though its cash flows have improved. Our story is that, uh, is that Russell 2000 is a much wider followed index, is a much bigger index than Russell 1000, and that would explain the fall in the stock price. Now, very briefly, I, I know I'm running out of time. Let me show you a bit of our um, magnitudes. So we do not calibrate the model the way it is. We just do the Gordon growth model kind of calibration, and uh, which we can calibrate. We can look at the stock increases based on the index inclusion literature, which gives us a 6% stock increase, or based on margins paper, which gives us a 15 to 20% increase. So this is our range, and the rest is completely standard from the Gordon growth model. And this is the range that we get for the cost of, uh, for the subsidy translated into the decrease in the cost of capital. And the numbers, uh, that w the range that we like or that we think is reasonable ranges from 30 basis points to about 95 basis points. And this is consistent with a recent paper by Carlo Miris. He sent it to us. And he looks at uh, this effect empirically estimated in emerging market bonds and finds the difference in the cost of borrowing of index eligible bond relative to cost of borrowing by the same firm, but uh, elsewhere, of a hundred basis points. That's his headline result. So uh, let me not say anything else. Let me just conclude saying that we do have a host of uh, empirical implications, which we think would be nice to test. And let me just say that um, the asset management sector is very big. And uh, we hope that we have put our finger on an important distortion. And as the asset management sector continues to grow, this distortion will only get bigger. <laughs>